Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you all for following Serbian Association of Norway's first online conference dedicated to Serbs, Romas, Jews, and other anti-fascists, the innocent victims of Jasenovac concentration camp. A week ago, people all around the world marked the International Remembrance Day. Serbian Association of Norway is marking this day by commemorating the innocent victims or the, uh, innocent, the innocent victims from Jasenovac concentration camp whose voices have seldom been heard. We shall shed light on Jasenovac, Auschwitz of the Balkans, but we shall not forget to celebrate the victory over fascism too. This concentration camp stands out with its barbaric cruelty. One of Jasenovac's survivors, Georgi Milisha, wrote, everything, that one could ever write about Jasenovac's camp could only be a pale picture of Jasenovac and what it was, because none could ever overdo it when writing about Jasenovac and what happened there. The Jasenovac camp was the lowest level to which mankind could fall. It is a fascinating fact, though, that Jasenovac is very little known to the world audience. Egon Berger, Another Yasinovat survivor wrote in his testimony. It happens often these days that someone will ask me, since I survived, if Yasinovat was really that horrifying. I don't have a response to that. But I remember my father, my brothers, and the hundreds of thousands of poor people who lost their lives to the terrors of Yasenovac. We, Serbs in Norway, believe that this is exactly the best way and, uh, to give an answer to this question, remembering the innocent, innocent victims of Ustasha regime, ethnic Serbs, Jews, Romas, and other anti-fascists. This conference will be divided into three parts. The first part, in the first part, you will hear the Lithuanian actress and theatre director Karina Tushuiko, who will tell you how she learned about this topic and her ways on, of working on it. She will also show us an, a short excerpt from a play she is making. In the second part, we shall hear Professor Dr. Gideon Greif, a world-known expert on Auschwitz and the author of the book Jasenovac, Auschwitz of the Balkans, the first of the three books that will be published on this topic. He will tell us the story of Jasenovac's concentration camp. In the last part, the Norwegian historian, Knut Fluvik Torison, will tell us about the prisoners who were sent from Jasenovac's camp to the concentration camps in Northern Norway. And now, dear audience, the Lithuanian actress and the theater reg regisseur, Karina Tushuiko. Dear Karina, welcome. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my acquaintance with Yasenovitz began at one meeting. Once at film festival in Russia, I heard a voice. Are you waiting for me? Uh, I turned up and saw an interesting tall man with the long hair. It was Simo Berdar, uh, the man who has completely changed my life. And uh, as it turned out, I was really waiting for him. He's the main expert on the subject of Yasenovitz. The world got to know about that terrible concentration camp thanks to Simo Berdar. He was the director of Memorial Complex, invited all, uh, all famous TV channels to filming there, uh, talked about it in his documentaries, uh, which uh, were shown all, all, all over the world and had received dozens of awards. This man has devoted more than 30 years of his life for studying the events happens there. And today I'm going to read an excerpt from Simo's poem, Gradina D. Gradina was the part of the Senevitz camp, the most terrible and sophisticated tortures on the prisoners took place in Gradina. Um, I will read it in English and a small part of the fragment in Serbian. Um, most of torched in Yasenovac were Serbs. So I want you to feel the language of those people and um, the language of the author as well. 
um, my Serbian is not, not very good, but um, I'll try my best to read it. So, Simo Brdar, Gradina D. The sun comes up and goes down, just as people come into existence and go out of this world, building their nests of illusions and deceptions, reveries and good and bad fortune, lying down on their beds of soil and grass, beautifully amazed, eternally gazing at the sky. The free logic of our coming into being is our birth, and our departure is our natural death. And yet, nothing made sense at that place. Their illusions were shuttered. Night, the morning mother, had her throat slit. There was no day, no father in sight. Their gashes gaped and gushed and dogs slept human blood. Their men when pu were put in gifts, even one-legged one, shackled nonetheless. Their beasts were let loose against humans to slaughter them all. In the autumn of 1941, the Ustashi formed the Camp Yasanovets, the infamous Yasanovets concentration camp. Barbed wire, not enough. Behold, Inmates dressing stone to wall yourself up. Fancy the harm you want to do yourself. A five meter tall wall, first to the east. So the sun may rise, lay, uh, may rise late on you. So it may stay high up, far, far away. So you never set your eyes on it. So it may hover high and hot, boiling your brain. Water, bless drops, bless darlings, besprinkle my mouth, not a drop to wet my dry mouth sands. A five meter tall wall laid by skeletal inmates to the west, so no one may see you descend, decline when you're throbbing juggler. They cut. A wall on the north side, five meters tall, lame bodies, lame steps, blue legs swollen and creased, utterly fountain people leaving bloody trails, gushing puss and sweat. And yet, the wall must be five meters tall until you shorter, until it's an impossible barrier, an unending torment. Until the end. The south side, no wall. The Sava River, that is the exit. It's horizon infinite. That is Gradina, the biggest place of suffering. God, that is the way out. Death is the way out. Serbs, Jews, Rowan, those who had to be exterminated. The mallet, silence. The mallet, a head bursting. The moon swing along with the grave. You have to dug with your own hands on and on. Life inmates forced into graves. Pressing tie against one another. Mallets, clubs, adzes, axes. People standing and dying, some still alive. The ground over the living beings, alive upon the dead, a funeral moon. Blood gushes out for hours on. The ground whirls, moves, blues, like an invisible dragon. The Ustashi uh, the used a recipe to make a soap from parts of inmates' bodies, 12 cauldrons, cauldron capacity, 2,200 liters, the recipe, got the recipe, 5 kilos of human flesh, 
10 liters of water, 1,000 grams of caustic soda. At the Asanavats, they wrench the souls. At the Asanavats, at Gradina, they wrenched the flesh. Sava flowed in between skin and bone for soap. No one can whitewash this savagery. A harm. The Usta should take away the most beautiful women, maidens, girls, disgrace. Catholic priest Maistorovich Filipovich shooting between women's spread legs, bleeding. They perish for hours, even days. Motherhood and blood seeping into the Sava. The horrendous stream ran from 1941 for four years. 130 mass graves, grave fields, grave silence. Today it's a memorial. Donia Gradita, Donia Tachka Lutske Sudbine. Megapolis mrtvih, avenije ljudske krvi i materinskog mlijeka, gdje u rano jutro slavuju i dopjevavaju nedopjevane pjesme, a predvečer je svitaca uznose vatre nedogorjeli duša i vjižu ih u krošnje drveća, a vjetrovi i trave nižu dječje glave na slačka. Gori gradina, gori gajevi ljudskih duša. Hundreds of benches for seven hundred thousands of tormented inhabitants. Also for you when you visit. So you may sit among them so they can tell you. In the year of something nine, in the year of something one, maybe in 2021. When you start bathing in cold sweat, when your brain explodes and your teeth come out with terror, when your palate and your palms are so stern clammy, there is a bench for you to sit down. There is a bench for you to lean against. The time of microchips must be impetus for you not to give the beast a chance. Do not excuse yourself on ground of circumstances, historical, as they may be. When I first time visited a memorial complex, the place shocked me. There are no words to describe my feelings and thoughts I experienced being there. Great silence, great fields. I strongly believe that people must know about it and uh, must remember the things happened there. So I started telling. Um, I organized several screenings of uh, Simo Brdar films here in Lithuania, in particular in Vilnius National Jewish Gaon Museum. Uh, I presented his films in Kazakhstan, Russia, Bosnia, uh, Serbia. And with my students, we have made a voice performance. Uh, well, now they are graduated actors, brilliant and uh, talented people. Um, the performance is a fusion of Serbian and Lithuanian culture. It seems um, a huge part of Serbian roots are there in Yasenovac. I think uh, that's why there are many answers to questions of their present times. Therefore, the part of the, our performance is dedicated to Yesenovats. Um, there are no words, only folk songs and sound of voices. Um, we're already invited to Republika Srpska with this performance, um, and uh, uh, we're planning to show this performance in 2022 when uh, in the center of Kaunas, when this city um, becomes an European capital of culture.
And today we'll show you a small excerpt from the rehearsal of the play. Uh, but uh, I will ask you to prepare. Uh, turn the sound on your devices a little bit louder, up 60-80%. Mm, it will start from a dark screen. It's okay. It should be. Just plunge into the darkness of voices. Please. Thank you very much, Karina, uh, for sharing this very powerful story and poem and performance with us. And now we have come to the second part of the conference where the professor, where professor Dr. Gideon Greif, the author of the book Jasenovac Auschwitz of the Balkans, will tell us more about Jasenovac concentration camp. Professor. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very honored to be here with you today. I hope you can hear me and see me. I will mostly compare Yesenovats and Auschwitz. Um, as we already heard, one of the few survivors of uh, Yesenovats, uh, Dorje Milisha, said that Yesenovats camp was the lowest level to which mankind could fall. And he was certainly right. The cruelty that prevailed in the Yasenovats camp makes it to a hell on earth. Another survivor of Auschwitz this time, Michiel Dinur Feiner, who also is known as Katzetnik, said about another hell on earth, the Auschwitz camp complex and the concentration and extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau, that it was another planet where normal human values 
were turned upside down. We would say the same about the Asenovats camp, even if it is in reality in some central points different from Auschwitz. In order to give you some insights uh, about the historical and moral meaning of the Asenovats camp, I will today mostly compare both camps, both hell on earth. Analyzing the nature, the essence and character of Auschwitz and comparing it to Yesenovats permits, without any feeling of exaggeration, to speak about the historical and moral meaning of Yesenovats. Erwin Miller, another survivor of Yesenovats, said the following, I'm quoting, Indeed, the camp was infamous for its brutality, where the systematic extermination surpassed even the German Nazi methods. It has often been referred to as the Auschwitz of the Balkans. And this is the title I have chosen for my book. While Auschwitz all over the world has become the symbol and synonym of the cruelties of the Holocaust, even the existence of Yesenovats is still unknown to many, even those who intensively deal with the history of World War II and the Holocaust. This is, of course, a fact that should be changed as soon as possible. Yesenovats should be known all over the world. Both camps, ladies and gentlemen, Auschwitz and Yesenovats, although belonging to different geographical spaces, are synonyms and symbols of the extremely cruel regimes they represented. Auschwitz has become a synonym for the whole Holocaust and crimes of Nazi Germans, whereas Yosinovats has become synonym for the unprecedented Ustasha empire of cruelty of the so-called independent state of Croatia. Both places, Yesenovats and Auschwitz embody the non-human principles of the two regimes and their murderous attitude towards anyone they considered as enemy, an undesirable or inferior person, or those who did not enthusiastically enough support the regime. As through comparison between the Auschwitz chain of camps and the Asenovat chain of camps, reveals many identical aspects relative to the development of its camps, the technique of killing, and the attitude of the perpetrators towards the prisoners. Naturally, there were also significant differences between Yesenovats and Auschwitz due to the origin of and mentality of the criminals and to their psycho psychologists. Through generations, human society developed a code of moral values in order to protect its cultural achievements and in order to ameliorate the moral codes of civilization. This system of moral codes was completely annihilated in Auschwitz as well as in Yesenovitz. Three thousand years of civilization were destroyed at once and replaced by a destructive murderous, anti-human set of values. Darkness obscured humanity and millions of innocent people had to live under the brutal rule of terror. That is exactly what Yechiel Dinur meant when he called Auschwitz another planet. Auschwitz, the biggest Nazi concentration and extermination death camp and Yesenovats, the biggest complex of Croatian Ustasha concentration and death camps were both sites which deserve the title Hen on Earth. In the following minutes, we are going to compare the two hells. Both the Nazi and Ustasha regime were motivated by racial theory, which dictated their policy and their behavior. <coughs> Nazi racial theory was central in all spheres of German public life from January 30th, 1933 onwards. Sorry. <coughs> when the new regime came to power, the whole nation was obsessively considering the question of blood purity 
and racial purity. The results of the investigations into racial origins were crucial for the career and even life for each individual. German medical doctors and genetists collaborated with the regime and helped to decide who was to be taken to the special program for so-called euthanasia, the murder of those life unworthy to live. Anti-Jewish legislation was based on racial principles and led to mass discrimination and hatred directed towards the Jews in Germany and later in other countries under German occupation. The Ustasha regime was greatly influenced by German racial theory and fully adopted it. From the first day, the existence of the Ustasha independent state of Croatia, the government implemented racial laws against the Jews, the Serbs, and Roma, using the exact methods of discrimination which were already in place in Germany. The racial laws had a strong effect on the daily life of Serbs, Jews, and Roma, who lost their positions in laws, lost their civil rights, and their property. Finally, the laws enabled the authorities to deport them into concentration camps and extermination camps. All these racial laws paved the way for the policy of annihilation and murder. As a result of racial legislation and the policy of discrimination against elements which were defined as hostile to the Croat nation's spirit, Serbs and Jews and other innocent victims were forced to wear identification marks which aimed to publicly humiliate them. For the Jews, it was the letter J, and for the Serbs, it was the letter P. Ladies and gentlemen, Auschwitz is known as the biggest factory of death among the camps which Nazi Germany established in order to implement its fi the final solution of the Jewish question. Its size was 40 square kilometers. 40 square kilometers. Not big, not very big. However, at the beginning of its existence, Auschwitz was not an extermination camp. It was a concentration camp. There is some difference. The original intention of the Nazi authorities was to build it as a prison for the local Polish population, suspected to be hostile and dangerous to the German army or found guilty of acts of resistance. The turning of Auschwitz into a factory of death was the result of previous experience based on the method of the German mass killings implemented during the Barbarossa operation. This operation started on June 22, 1941. In the framework of the Barbarossa operation, about 1,6 million Jews were murdered by the so-called Einsatzgruppen, mostly by shooting, partially in gas, gas vents. The system of mass murder was problematic for the perpetrators for several reasons. It was too slow, too expensive, and psychologically problematic for the murderers who had to look directly into the eyes of their victims. During the few months of such mass killing, as conducted in Babi Yar, the German commanders responsible for the final solution in the Soviet Union decided to change the method completely and instead of shooting, introduced permanent killing centers where no guns were used uh, but instead poisonous gas. The new system solved the problems that I have just mentioned. It was cheaper, it was quicker, and the killers didn't have to look into the eyes of their victims. The only contact with the murdered victims were the screams which emerged from the gas chambers and which could be heard around the area. The mass killing process in Auschwitz was completely impersonal. As we shall see later, the Yasenovats, in Yasenovats, the system was totally different. It was personal, it was direct, it was manual, a close, intimate, 
passionate murder. This is the way the Ustasha murderers liked it. Personal, direct, manual, a close, intimate, passionate murder. This makes the difference. On the basis of the criminal and pathologically distorted ideology of the Nazis and the Ustasha, the similarities between the two camps are easy to be distinguished. The Ustasha regime was to a very great extent influenced by Nazi Germany and its ideology and wanted by all means to demonstrate this close relationship to Nazism. The best example of this fact is that the final solution of the Jewish question in Yugos ex-Yugoslavia was introduced by the Ustasha even before it was introduced by the Germans, much before. When the Ustasha started implementing, implementing anti-Jewish measures in April 1941, April 1941, the final solution was not even decided by the German Nazi authorities. It's amazing. The killing process in Auschwitz was more sterile and cleaner, with some distance between the murderers and their victims, whereas the killing process in Yasenovac was more direct and the murderers enjoyed looking at their victims being murdered and tortured and did not need any physical distance during the execution of their crimes. This point demonstrates that the Ustasha killers acted according to more barbaric lines of behavior than the Germans, a fact which even German reports about the Senovats point out. In this sense, the report of the General Gleise von Horstenau, the German military envoy to Zagreb, is worthy to note. For the German officers, the methods of Ustasha killings were too wild and too barbaric in comparison to the system enacted in the German factories of death, like Auschwitz Birkenau, Chelno, Belgets, Treblinka, Majdanek, Sobibor, and Mali Trostinets. Despite their demonic crimes, the Germans still wanted to be considered cultured. Photos which exist show us the amusement and fun of the Ustasha murderers while performing their crimes and monstrous competitions, who will kill more overnight. In one case, if I'm not wrong, more than 1,200 innocent prisoners were murdered in Yesenovitz during one night. They didn't have psychological problems while doing their cruel deeds, nor did they feel any twinge of conscience. This difference allows us to state that the killing process in Yesenovats was much more barbaric, much more brutal, and much more primitive. The sophistication needed by the Germans to protect their soul was not needed at all by the Ustasha killers. So the Germans were a little more sophisticated. In order to implement the new killing system in Auschwitz, a new mass murder process was developed based on the use of poisonous gas, in this case, gas called commercially Cyclon B, in German, Zyklon B. At the beginning of 1942, two sites of mass murder were prepared in Birkenau, a subcamp of Auschwitz to which the killing activity was transferred from the main camp. The murder was conducted in two buildings, the so-called Red House or Bunker Nummer 1 and the so-called White House or Bunker Nummer 2. The first transports of Jews who were deported to their death by the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, RSHH, reached the new killing facilities in Birkenau in February 1942. Remember, the Ustasha starts on April 41. Due to the process of further modernization, the two bunkers were temporarily abandoned and four new modern buildings emerged in spring 1942, gas chambers and crematoria numbers two to five. 
the steady tendency of modernization of the industrial mass killing is strongly different from the mass killing in Yasenovans, where the process of killing can be defined as very primitive from the beginning until the very end. So the Ustasha did not need any modernization. They were very pleased with the barbaric primitive style of their own camp. That doesn't imply that the primitivity had any impact on the number of victims, but shows the primitive way of thinking of the Croat Ustasha criminals who were satisfied with their own bestial ways of killing and did not look for ways to, to modernize, pleased as they were with the existing methods. The German method resembled a typical industrial process, namely, the purpose was to obtain the greatest results, in this case, the murder of the highest number of innocent people, mostly Jews, for the least cost, like in any normal factory. Nevertheless, the teams in these camps, the Nazi Germans and the Ustasha Croats as well, had a very important common denominator. They were trained not to show the slightest sense of mercy, sympathy or empathy towards their victims. No mercy, no sympathy, no empathy. On the contrary, they, they enjoyed their brutal and aggressive behavior and looked for new methods of torture, the way to prolong the prisoner's death, and competed who could conflict the most extreme torture, humiliation, and death. The Ustasha, however, were very happy to dirty their hands, and the bloodier their hands, the happier they were. Inside the German killing facilities, the principle of remaining clean was introduced by using Jewish slaves in a variety of activities which allowed the German murderers to keep their hands clean. The German like it to remain clean. Hundreds of Jews were recruited to the special squad, the so-called Sonderkommando, which were forced to conduct the most humiliating work in the process of killing, although the killing itself, and this is important to emphasize, was always conducted exclusively by the German SS. The Jewish slaves had to carry the bodies of the murdered Jews to the crematoria to remove their valuables, gold teeth, and cut the women's hair, and to throw the bodies into the crematoria ovens, and finally to throw the ashes into the surrounding rivers. In this way, the perpetrators, the German perpetrators, had only to give the orders and not execute the work with their own hands, which should remain clean. The impersonal method of killing in Auschwitz was principally based on the famous speech held by the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, in which he emphasized the following, I'm quoting, we will never get our hands dirty, we will remain clean, end of quote. The necessity of remaining clean dictated the patterns of behavior of the German teams of the camp of Auschwitz. In Yasenovats, such an idea of cleanliness did not exist. The regulations in Auschwitz were clear and permanent. There was a significant difference between those who were sent immediately to their death after being selected on the ramp by a medical doctor and those who could temporarily remain alive but become slaves. Those who were sentenced to death, 70 to 90%, of the newly arrived usually did not live for more than four hours, four hours after their arrival. The others, five to 15%, were selected to become slaves, as I've just mentioned. For those who became prisoners or slaves, the biggest challenge was to survive under the inhuman conditions which prevailed in the camp. It was especially important to maintain the desire to live. This desire was essential for the continuation of the will 
to live. Yesenovat survivors report the same psychological principle. As long as they did not lose their desire or passion to live, they had a chance of survival. In Yesenovats, however, the life of prisoners was more chaotic. There was not the same amount of constant and clear rules a prisoner could adapt in order to improve his chances of survival. So we can say even cynically that Auschwitz was an orderly camp while Yesenovats was totally chaotic. Both camps, ladies and gentlemen, underwent a long process of dynamic development. As I already mentioned, Auschwitz did not start as an extermination camp. In 1940, its first goal was to be a concentration camp for the local Polish population, a large prison for Poles suspected of being hostile to the German occupying forces or suspected to be part of the Polish underground movement. Only in late 1941, after the decision on the final solution, did Auschwitz become an extermination camp, where the final solution of the Jewish question was to be implemented. From June 1941, it also was a concentration camp or a large, a large prison for Soviet prisoners of war who were captured during the Barbarossa operation. The fact that until late 1941, Auschwitz was not yet a factory of death does not mean that prisoners were not treated brutally and bestially or that they were not murdered. This is not the case. Many prisoners died or were murdered from the first day of the existence of Auschwitz because of the harsh conditions, the cruelty of the guards, and the fundamental policy of maltreatment, dehumanization, and starvation. Yesenovats was a place of death from the first day and the mass killing there did not require any official decision. So you see the difference. Like the decision of the final solution. In Yasenovats, it wasn't needed at all. Nevertheless, even Yasenovats underwent, underwent some changes which were caused by the war developments or by political changes in the region. And it was de dependent on the successes and defeats of Nazi. Germany. The killing methods in Yesenovats developed over time and became more extreme and more brutal based on the same principles of non-humanity and non-mercy in the attempts to cause to the prisoners the utmost suffering. The utmost suffering. Another difference refers to the policy of secrecy. The Germans tried to hide the reality from their victims by distributing lies and fake information of what awaits their victims, disguising the killing sites as showers or public bath. The murderers of Yesenovats were more direct and though they had nothing to hide, committing their crimes under open skies. A very clear point of similarity is the greed of both Germans and the Ustasha. The victims, murdered or imprisoned, had to hand over all their property which they brought to the camp, and the perpetrators were now the new owners of their property. Possessions such as apartments, bank accounts, jewelry, valuables were already confiscated before arrival in the camp. The Germans were no doubt the greatest murderers in history, but also the greatest thieves in history. The Ustasha acted under similar lines and started the confiscation of property of Jews and Serbs by April 1941. Again, earlier than the Germans, half a year earlier. It's amazing. The Ustasha authorities, under the leadership of uh, Ante Pavelic, tried to imitate Germany and became even more extreme. Or in other words, I would define it that the pupil 
wanted to become more extreme than his teaching. I would like to show you now some photos I have collected, especially for this evening. I hope I will succeed. Um, how do we do it? Can you see the presentation now? Okay, I think we have to wait for a couple of seconds because it takes time sometimes to show the presentation. Can you see it? Not yet. Not yet. Have you, you have the, uh, gone through share screen and then the picture me, with. Let me see. Mm -hmm. I don't want to waste so you... time of our listeners. Okay. So I will continue. Okay. Yeah. We will try again. Yes. Dear friends, another point of similarity is the fact that the camps were a state inside a state. No ministry, no court, no politician could intervene in the reality of the regulations of the camps, both Auschwitz and the Senovats. The SS and the Ustasha as well saw the camps as their own kingdom and felt they could do anything without being criticized, without being inspected, without being punished. They felt they could continue with their barbaric crimes forever. Indeed, Auschwitz and Yesenovats were among the longest lasting concentration and extermination camps, remaining in operation almost until the end of the war. It is also amazing. Until January 1945 and April 1945, respectively. The longest camps. Until the last moment, the camp staff were sure they could go on interrupt uninterruptedly forever, not realizing that the war was going to come to an end very soon. For Nazi Germany, the final solution and the existence of Auschwitz were now, at the end of the war, more important than anything else, than any national interest, even becoming the most important national interest. Yes, the uh, killing of Jews within the framework of the so-called final solution became in 1941 national interest number one, not two, not three, number one. In light of imminent defeat in the war, the annihilation of the Jewish people was considered the most important goal, the most important goal. The Ustasha came to the same conclusion and considered the continuation of Yasenovats as the most important interest of the so-called independent state of Croatia. Another point of similarity is that in both camps there was a total loss of sanctity of life. The life of the victims had no value, whereas death was worshipped. In both places, death was de developed into an art and into an ideology. It seems that the members of the SS and the Ustasha competed among themselves who would become more cruel, more barbaric, and more sadistic. The policy of non-human attitude prevailed in both places, robbing the prisoners of the minimal human dignity, minimal living conditions, minimal sanitary conditions, trying to ruin their inner spirit and the psyche, exploiting their bodily strengths, and finally killing them in various methods, by poisonous gas, burning alive, cutting bodies into pieces, starvation, beating, hanging, etc. Karina told us some of the horrible, most horrible methods of torture and killing. In both camps, an inversion of values existed. In Auschwitz, as well as in Yesenovats, 
a different scale of values was adopted, which stand opposite to the normal values of the world before World War II. In other words, the Ten Commandments were reversed. For instance, thou shalt not kill was reversed into thou shall kill. There is a famous sentence written by the Jewish poet Paul Celan that says, death is a master from Germany. Der Tod ist ein Meister aus Deutschland. The same can be said about the Ustasha. Death is a master from Croatia. Despite the sense of security that there would be no punishment for the crimes, both camps had severe measures of security to prevent the outside world from getting information of what is going on in the camps. Accordingly, every effort was made not to allow the prisoners to escape, both in Auschwitz as well as in Yesenowitz. Any attempt to escape was considered the worst crime. In comparison to Auschwitz, some of the camps attached to Yesenowitz were dedicated to only female or child prisoners. Auschwitz subcamps did not have such places, and women and men stayed together, although always separated. Both camps tried to exploit the physical power or energy of the prisoners for their own benefit by establishing factories or workshops as the possibility of replacing the laborers with new slaves was so easy. However, the similar policy of not supplying enough food or adequate working conditions caused the quick death of slaves, slave workers in both places and the East industry of semi-industry in both camps was not product productive due to the inhuman treatment of the prisoners. Both camps, Auschwitz and Jesenovac, deprived the prisoners of the most natural needs of human beings. Among other aspects, it is important to emphasize the lack of pro proper medical treatment in both camps. Prisoners who became sick or exhausted could not get help and died in pain, getting no medications or almost no medications. In Auschwitz, the so-called hospital had nothing in common with the normal clinics or hospitals, providing no real treatment or real medications. A similar situation existed in Yasenovac. Sick prisoners, knowing that the so-called hospital would not cure or heal them, preferred not to complain and continued their slave work hoping to be cured naturally. In both places, it was clear to the prisoners that to complain about their health would just bring them closer to their death. In both places, medical staff was involved in the criminal activities. Yes, doctors became murderers. In Auschwitz and in Yesenowitz, for the first time in history, the doctor doesn't heal you, he kills you. He murders you. Comparing Auschwitz and Yesenovac, the first might be considered to belong to the 20th century, while Yesenovac reminds us more of the Inquisition of the 16th century, where you, which used primitive methods of torture and killing. <coughs> Unfortunately, those primitive methods were not less effective than the German ones. The modern, or the so-called modern character of Auschwitz and the primitive character of Senovats can also be seen in the case of the administration. Auschwitz had a very modern administrative system. It has several departments, secretaries, translators, adjutants, a technical team, etc. All this was linked to the German government. There was, of course, a big gap in the normal correspondence between offices, but we should not forget that this correspondence tried to hide the huge crime. On the other hand, Yasenovac did not have any of this. 
It had no offices, no regular correspondence, nor intelligent Jewish secretaries. It was a primitive reality with no necessity of official administration. In comparison to Auschwitz, Yasenovats did not produce any secret diaries or reports. The most important Auschwitz documents are called the Auschwitz Scrolls, which describe the miserable lives of the Jews belonging to the so-called Special Squad. In both places, prisoners never gave up their hope to be liberated and made attempts to escape. In Auschwitz, relatively speaking, it was easier and hundreds of prisoners tried to escape. Most of them didn't succeed, like in the case of Yasenovats, where they tried even though it was more complicated and risky. And only towards the end did the prisoners have such success in breaking out of the camp. The con constant attempts of escape show us that the spirit of the prisoners was not, was not destroyed and was not murdered. Another significant difference is that, Auschwitz in, that in Auschwitz there was an underground movement quite well organized, whereas in Yasenovats there were no conditions for the creation of such an underground movement. The similarity between the two camp system is primarily the result of the fact that national socialism in Germany was similar to Ustashism. Both are extreme, destructive ideologies which planned and executed murderous plans which brought about an annihilation of millions of innocent people. By understanding that Ustashism is no different to Nazism, we might better understand the criminal acts of the independent state of Croatia government. Extremely significant is the fact that the Ustasha introduced the final solution even before the Germans did it. I emphasize the fact for the second time. The persecution of Jews, the deportation to the Asenovac camps, the confiscation of their property, and all anti-Jewish steps were introduced earlier than in Germany, where the final solution starts only late 1941. Yasenovats became the slaughterhouse of the Yugoslav Jews, even though at the time Auschwitz was not yet an extermination camp. The conclusion arises that the Ustasha were quicker, quicker than the Germans in their final solution, or alternatively, that the crimes of the Ustashas were the final solution before the final solution. How much time do I still have? You have 10 more minutes if you need them. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Dear friends, the speed of the policy of persecution by the Croatian, Croatian government was much faster than the speed of the German government. The Croatian pupil, as I mentioned, was quicker than his German teacher and master. Auschwitz and Jasenovac symbolize the extreme policy of dehumanization of the body as well as the spirit and the means of reaching those goals were mainly terror and humiliation. The sanctity of human beings did not exist. The only human beings were the murderers themselves who got the best possible conditions and food and enjoyed the property of their victims. I'm always asked, did the guards in both camps, were they forced to work there? Were Germans forced to work in Auschwitz? Were Ustashas forced to work in Yasenovac? Not at all. They stood in queue because the conditions were so good, good salary, a lot of food, alcohol free. And for those who had sadistic tendencies, it was a paradise. So they were not forced at all. They wanted to work there. The dehumanization was conducted towards all prisoners in both camps, mainly to Serbs, Jews, and Roma. 
And it's very significant for me as a Jew to emphasize that in Yasenovats, Serbs, Jews, and Roma died, suffered and died together. Both camps had only two kinds of people the group which had everything and the group which had nothing. In both camps, the attitude of unnecessary suffering was used in order to amuse those causing the suffering. They enjoyed it enormously. Murdering or killing a prisoner without causing suffering was not good enough for the perpetrators. Unless the prisoner was tortured and humiliated, his death was not enough. Only death plus humiliation plus torture. Unnecessary torture is a term developed by the American sociologist Daniel J. Goldhagen in his book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, published in 1996. For these purposes, a variety of methods were introduced to prolong the process of death, causing the victim horrible suffering on one hand and amusement for the murderers on the second hand. In Auschwitz and Yasenovats, all repressed, brutal, and even emotions could be expressed without any fear of the consequences. Within the framework of terror, the camp authorities in both places, Auschwitz and Yasenovats, tried to implement an extreme policy of punishment for real and imaginary crimes, or so-called crimes of the prisoners. For any form of disobedience, the prisoners were punished severely, and very often the punishment was death. A point of similarity of both camps in, is that after the war, there were attempts to, at diminishing the number of victims and to characterize the camps as only slave labor camps and not death camps. Unfortunately, this is the case with Auschwitz, with the so-called denial of the Holocaust, and the same is conducted by Croat, still pro ustasha circles, who try to diminish the scope and nature of crimes. This tendency in the context to Auschwitz is called Holocaust denial, but we might use the same term concerning Yasenovats. There is a denial of Yasenovats and the ustasha crimes by the young generations, and both unfortunately continues to this day. Morally, this phenomenon can be seen as a second murder of the victims. Yes, a second murder. The denial murders the victims for the second time, while ignoring their existence, desecrates their human dignity, and is a murder of their memory. Since the causing of pain and endless suffering was important for the perpetrators in both Auschwitz and Yasenovats, on personal initiative by the guards, new instruments of torture were developed. In Auschwitz, the place was the most, which was the most creative in developing the tools was the so-called politische Abteilung, the political department. Infamous was the Schaukel, developed by the SS man Wilhelm Bogel. It was an instrument which broke almost all the bones of the prisoner under interrogation. Torturing the prisoners was a daily phenomenon, and the sky was the limit in causing pain to a prisoner who had to be punished. Exactly the same occurred in Yasenovats, where an Ustasha guard invented the new device called the Serb cutter. I would like to show it to you, but we have some technical problem. Uh, I guess you have seen it. Uh, and other instruments of torture and death. Places like Auschwitz and Yasenovats enabled people with sadistic tendencies to express themselves perfectly. Humiliation was extremely important for the Nazis. Humiliations were used against the Jews, but also against non-Jews. The most favorite form of humiliation was public humiliation with the participation of the audience. Concerning Jews, the policy of humiliation did not stop when the German policies changed in 1941. From expulsion to the final solution 
the Jews had to be humiliated even minutes before they were guests in the guest chambers when men and women had to undress together before being guests. Some of them were religious, did not even undress at home, and now they have to undress completely men and women together in order to humiliate them. Even before, during the mass killing of the Einsatzgruppen, Jews had to undress before being shot to death. In Yasenovats, the same policy of humiliation was introduced for the amusement of the killers. Both places, Auschwitz and Yasenovats as well, started very modestly. At the beginning, Auschwitz was nothing more than one small concentration camp of only 28 buildings or barracks called the main camp or in German Stammlager. Later on, new sub camps were added. The most important and biggest one was Birkenau, which was opened in October 1941. Later on, 43 other sub camps became part of the Auschwitz camp complex and the so called Interessengebiet. Auschwitz then was divided into three parts, Stammlager, Birkenau, and Buna Monowitz. A sense of self-confidence and power caused both places, Auschwitz and Jasenovac, to grow and grow steadily. In 1943, Auschwitz became an empire. It had 44 subcamps or branches spread across an area of 40 square kilometers. The same happened with Jasenovac, which grew and developed many subcamps in an area of 240 square kilometers, where thousands of people were imprisoned and murdered. Therefore, Auschwitz and Jasenovac can be called kingdoms of suffering, dehumanization, and death. The rapid expansion of both camps symbolizes the passion of power of the SS and Ustasha, and simultaneously shows us how the ideology of death became significant and even popular. I would like uh, now to sum up my lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, the various examples which were mentioned in this historical introduction lead us to the conclusion that among criminal regimes, there is worst, but sometimes even worse than the worst. Nazi Germany brought criminality against humanity, which the world hadn't seen to that point. Analyzing all above mentioned manifestations of evil, it is not difficult to come to the conclusion that the Ustasha regime and its atrocities were even worse than German Nazi atrocities. The Ustasha's wicked minds overshadowed in many aspects the murderous minds of the German Nazis. The technique of murder of the Ustasha were much more brutal, wilder, and more malicious. The Croats even surpassed the Germans in their wickedness and in their bloodlust. It seems that they lost all humanity. It is therefore justified, justified to define Yasenovats as the Auschwitz of the Balkans. We have emphasized the common denominators, the differences, and the identical aspects, and although it is not always possible to compare the two regimes, in this case it is legitimate and even recommended in order to send a warning to the world. And by this I am concluding my lecture. Auschwitz and Jasenovats should never, never be repeated again. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for your very uh, informative presentation. Uh, you told us a story that is nearly 80 years old. So uh, I wonder if you, if you can now tell us why this story can never become too old or irrelevant. Why or what can humankind learn from this story? Oh, a lot, a lot. 
uh, I think both camps should be a, a vivid warning against tyranny, against barbaric values, against murderous tendencies, which still are in, the, in our world. Um, the danger for our mankind, for good and, and decent people, the danger is still valid. We have to be a very alert to, to such um, negative and barbaric regimes. And whenever they start, we have to eliminate them by all means. I mean that humanity should not allow such regimes to exist more than one hour, one minute. And it is easy because they have so clear uh, manifestations. You see them, you feel that it is a non-human regime. If you feel it, protest, do anything you can not to allow such regimes like the Ushasha or not, like Nazi Germany to exist. Nazi Germany existed 12 years. Can you imagine? 60 million people paid with their innocent life. Such a regime should not have remained more than five minutes. 12 years. It's too much. 12 years too much. And the Ustasha regime, fa almost five years. Five years too much. Decent people should not allow this to happen again. Because always under such regimes, innocent people pay with their innocent life and this should never happen again so we have we have signs signs of warning they are very very clear you, you see them you don't have to 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 search them underground they are clear and in if such case again emerges we have to do we decent people have to do all we can to prevent such regimes such tyrannies such dictatorships to rule our lives because it always costs the life of innocent and good and decent people. So it's a living warning to all of us to say no, to protest, not to collaborate. I, I guess the culture of remembrance is also a way to prevent uh, such uh, things to happen again. And uh, I think Jewish people, you have quite an admiring culture of remembrance. And then I think of the Balkans and uh, of the culture of remembrance there. And I guess we have um, ma many things to learn from the Jewish people when it comes to the culture of remembrance. And then I wonder, what do you think that the culture of remembrance can bring to the region of the Balkans? What can we learn from it? We in Jewish culture say, if you do not remember your past, you will never have a, had a, have a future. Can you imagine we celebrate every year the expulsion of the Jews from Egypt? It happened not yesterday, not the other week, 3,000 years ago. We mentioned the destruction of the two temples also thousands of years ago. And this uh, everlasting memory uh, helps us to, to overcome all our troubles. We are a people which uh, has so many troubles, so much bloodshed, and the Holocaust, of course, which was the biggest catastrophe of the Jewish people. By remembering, first of all, we tell our children uh, to whom they belong, to which people they belong. And you, you cannot exist as a people if you erase your past. It's, it's impossible. So we have to remember. If you ask me what I recommend, is to revive history, to teach history, to learn history, and not the, the recent one, the old history. Serbs have a long history, the same as the Jewish people. We have a lot of, of common denominators, by the way. I feel always the similarity in our histories. Um, so learn your history, teach your history, don't be ashamed of your history, and this will help you to create a better future. It is important to remember. Not remembering your past uh, prevents you from building a better future. Thank you very much, Professor. We hope to see you again in one of the future conferences. Thank you so much. I am very honored to be your guest today. Thank we you. We are so honored to have you here. Thank so you. thank you very much. And now we are coming to the very last part of the conference, and we are going to hear a Norwegian historian, Knut Flovik Thoresen. Knut, welcome. Knut, 
Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, event, uh, seminar. Um, I will not put on my camera because of the uh, line, which can be a little bit bad. I had some technical problems earlier. Uh, my main focus in this short talk will be Norway as the outpost of the genocide of the Serbs from the so-called uh, independent state of Croatia. Uh, I think it is important and correct to say that my short lecture must be seen as an extension of uh, Professor Greif's lecture on Yasenovac, the Auschwitz of the Balkans, since I, as a Norwegian historian who has worked with the topic, would like to see an increased awareness about this among my fellow historians here in Norway. During the Second World War, more than 4,000 boys and men were sent from the former Yugoslavia to Norway as slave laborers. The German occupation force uh, wanted to expand roads, railways, and other infrastructure in northern part of Norway to secure the supply lines to the northern part of the Eastern Front against Russia. These prisoners who were sent here as slave laborers lived in very inhumane uh, conditions and 2,398 of them lost their lives. Whether a prisoner survived or died varied depending on which camp he was sent to. 82.5% of the prisoners who died did so in the autumn and the winter of 1942-43. Could you please change the slide? This, uh, this uh, slide uh, shows uh, Yasenovac on the uh, lower uh, part of the map. And then you see uh, Bergen in uh, the western part of Norway, where the gr largest group of the prisoners arrived before they were shipped off to the northern part of Norway. There were five camps. Uh, which the conditions were especially cruel and death rates were high. These were located in the northern part of Norway, as depicted on the map. And uh, it was these camps that were run by the SS, uh, for which the commanders were recruited from the German uh, concentration camp system and camps such as uh, Natzweiler, for instance. In addition to the murdering committed by the guards, it was hunger, diseases, and very harsh climatic conditions that led to the high death rates. In the Kara Shok camp, the one furthest north, only a quarter of the prisoners survived the winter of 1942 to 43. In the summer of 1942, 900 prisoners from uh, Yugoslavia arrived close to the small village of Baisio outside of Narvik. From June to September, 748 of these prisoners had died, which is a death rate of 83.5%. Let that uh, sink in for a while. Of 900 prisoners, 748 prisoners lost their lives in around two and a half months. On the 18th of Jul July, 1942, 288 prisoners were shot or burned inside the barracks by the guards. This was the single largest largest massacre in Norway, Norwegian soil during the Second World War. The lists of those who survived uh, the camps in Norway and were supposed to be repatriated to Yugoslavia can be found in the Norwegian state archives. And the lists of those who died in the uh, uh, can be found in the Norwegian War Grave Service. In total, there are 4,050 names on them. I will go through these lists, all the names and the places where the prisoners were from, and I have found that 93% of the prisoners from former Yugoslavia that were sent to Norway were ethnic Serbs, while the remaining 7% belonged uh, to the other nationalities in the former Yugoslavia. These findings are in accordance to, with previous 
research done by the university in Belgrade. There is no doubt that the vast ma ma majority of the prisoners were ethnic Serbs. The empirical data speaks for itself. In the past, attempts have been made to cover this, up these facts and the use of this piece of history for political aims. Such attempts highlight, highlights the importance of thorough and empirical historical research done by professional historians, such as the one done by the Nowik Center. The reason why 90% of the prisoners who came to Norway from former Yugoslavia were Serbs is twofold. First, the uprising was the largest in Serbia and the resistance struggle was initiated by the Serbs. Secondly, and my topic for today, is the Ustasha's genocide policy against the Serbs. A little more than half of the prisoners who were sent to Norway from Yugoslavia were Serbs from Serbia. The majority of these people were uh, uh, people who had resisted against the German occupation force. People who supported the communist resistance movement uh, and the royalist resistance movement. Some of the prisoners from Serbia were hostages or belongs, belonged to some other categories. The majority of the prisoners that came from the so-called independent state of Croatia were Kraina Serbs that had been arrested just because they were Serbs. While their remaining family members were massacred by the Ustasha in the Asenovac, men and boys between 14 and 60, who were found fit to work, were sorted out and sent to Norway as slave laborers. This was done as a barter trade between the German occupation forces and the Ustasha regime. And for these prisoners, Norway became the last outpost of the genocide committed by the Ustasha. This can be exemplified. For instance, the Ustasha entered the village of Jablanac in uh, Lika on the night of April the 14th, 1942. The village, village was burned and the elderly women and children were, were murdered in Jaserovac and Stara Gradiska, while the men were sent off to Norway. 130, 113 of Jablanac's men are buried in Norway. On April the 18th, 1942, Ustasha carried out an operation against the Serbian population in the Kordon district. The Serbian villages in that area were wiped out and the population was taken to Yosena Watts, where women and children were murdered. While many of the men were sent to Norway, 219 of the Serbian men from Kordon died in Norway. The Serbian inhabitants of the village, village Jasenovac, not the camp, I'm talking about the village outside the camp, and the nearby villages were arrested by the Ustasha on the 8th of May, 1942. 64 of, of men of the Serbs from Jasenovac's village are buried in Norway. The exam examples are numerous. Some of the Serbs that were sent to Norway were children as young as 14 years old. Most of these children came from uh, Kordun and Banja and were arrested by the Ustasha and sent to Jasenovac before being shipped off to uh, Norway. One of them was Milo, Milovoje Pajic from Vojnitz in Kordun. He was only 14 years old when he arrived in Norway and he survived the worst conditions and the massacre in Baisvold camp. Milo, Milo Voye died in the Rotwold camp outside of Trondheim in 1944. I wonder if he will ever set a stumbling stone or a snubblestein, as it is called in Norwegian, to honor the memory of Milo Voye and the other children who were sent to concentration camps in Norway to die just because they were Serbian boys. After the Second World War and up to 1989, the story of the prisoners was used to promote the Norwegian Yugoslav relationships, to, to sustain the myth of the Yugoslav partisan war, and to support the idea of the socialist Yugoslav state that existed between 1945 and 1991. The prisoners were presented as partisans and Yugoslavs, 
of course, some of the prisoners were partisans, and some were of nationalities other than Serbian. However, by making the, the prisoner, all the prisoners, partisans, Tito supporters, and Yugoslavs, the important historical fact that most of the prisoners were Serbs, and that many of the prisoner, Serbian prisoners who came to Norway were sent here to die as a part of a well organized state led genocide disappears. Thank you. That was my short uh, presentation. Thank you, Knut. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And we have two questions for you two, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you were talking about Norway. And, you know, in Norway, the search for the answers about the World War II, uh, it's a never ending story. It's uh, very much alive, even nowadays. And the debate about Matte Michelet's book, Va viste fronten, or What did the Norwegian resistance movement know, is a proof of this. So why do we constantly search for more answered, answers and insight in the past? Why is it like that? Uh, okay, this is was uh, twofold. Uh, uh, World War II history still engaged many people here in Norway, but compared to the Balkans, our Second World War history is relatively uncomplicated. Even so, there are still new things to shed lights on, even here in Norway. Uh, but it is important that we, as professional historians, base our research on facts. In all our research, research we must build foundations based on empirical data before we try to draw conclusions based only on facts not current political issues and personal biases. This is very important. And to your question, why uh, we constantly search for more insight in the past? I think uh, Gideon, uh, Professor Greif, answered that uh, quite good earlier. Uh, and it's a little bit more of a philosophical question. Uh, the past is our identity. Uh, we always search to the past to find our roots and to establish uh, where we belong. And of course, it's, this is very important to, for the human identity. So, yeah. Thank you. And the other one is a little bit nicer. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a positive question. And, you know, in Serbia, the story about Mama Karashok, uh, it's a Sami woman that has saved many Serbian and Yugoslav anti-fascist uh, prisoners. Well, that story is very well known. So we wonder if you can uh, think about coming to another conference and maybe telling a story about the, such heroes as Mama Karashok. Uh, yes, of course. There are uh, many such stories of uh, ordinary people that helped prisoners. Uh, uh, local Norwegian population that lived uh, in villages and uh, in these uh, very rural areas in the northern part of Norway. They didn't have much. Uh, but they were horrified by the condition, condition they saw there, even though the Germans tried to hide it. And uh, with the right risks of their own life, they tried to help the prisoners as much as they could. Some gave food, other helped prisoners escape to Sweden. The bonds between these Norwegians and the prisoners lasted for lives uh, and binds the Serbian and the Norwegian people together even today. So, yes. I would very much like to shed light on these stories uh, in the future. So hmm. that is good to hear. Well, thank you very much, Knut. And now uh, we have one last question for Karina. Karina, do you mind? Yes, please. Thank you. Well, you know, you showed that this uh, voice performance, uh, and sometimes it is said that uh, the performers with their voices they communicate dramatic truth. So what truth do you want your performance to communicate to the European and world audience? Uh, yes, the voice communicates in its uh, special way. Uh, if, we, if we talk about uh, our performance, as I said, it's just a part uh, about Yesenovats and it's all about um, the main thing, I, th I think, uh, in the world uh, about the unconditional true love which must be sought no matter what and even if it will take all your life so um 
people love you, <laughs> love each other. And that would be uh, the truth and my message. Thank you very much, Karina. And uh, we have now come to the very end of this year's conference. Uh, uh, before, you... can I interrupt you for a yes, second? Yes, of course. Yes, uh, welcome. One comment and one request. Maybe we can try now to show again the presentation. <laughs> Let's make another. <laughs> would you Would you like to try? Uh, yes, why yeah, not? Yeah, uh, you know where <laughs> you need sure to we will, we will be successful, but let's try. Yeah, it. let's try. Uh, there is this share, <laughs> this share icon. You know where you find it? Uh, but you have to be patient. Nice. Okay. Beautiful. It's coming. Your screen is coming up. I think. It, okay. And then down at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see your PowerPoint icon. So you can just open it. Excellent. It's perfect. Oh, almost. Not really. You, you <laughs> one, one more time. PowerPoint one more time. And oh. I think there. Now, can you see it? Now we can see it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you can take this uh, presentation mode. So let me show you the photos. Beautiful. So you can see, yes? Yes, we can see. Great. So this is the, this is, by the way, the poster of the, uh, uh, exhibition I have organized uh, together with uh, Ambassador uh, Liliana Nikšić, Ustasha uh, Empire of Cruelty. It was shown in the United Nations in New York uh, three years ago. Here is the uh, independent state of Croatia. Um, again, from the exhibition, this is, uh, you know, uh, head of the NDH, and important, the ident and identification with uh, Nazi Germany, the famous visit uh, in Berlin, uh, Pavelic and Hitler, shown here together. Some of the racial laws uh, published in uh, Rovatsky Narod, uh, against Serbs, against, against Jews and other innocent victims, decree forcing Jews to wear the special signs, the yellow badge. Here we see a Jewish family of Dora Kleinman wearing the Jewish insign in 1941. Uh, Jews wearing the yellow badge in, um, I think it's in Zagreb, but I'm not sure. Uh, again, the yellow badge, even children had to wear it in Croatia. Orders to, of, uh, against Jews and Serbs to move out of Syrian, uh, certain areas. Order of deportation to Yasenovats. I tried to collect your, some documents and photos. Uh, deportation of a Jew called uh, Samuel Hirschenhauser to Yasenovats. Uh, deportation of Jews on March 42 to Yasenovats. Special trains used for the deportations to Yasenovats. Um, we see here uh, 20, 119 to uh, Jews deported on September 41 to Yasenovats. Uh, Serbs deported to Yasenovac in 1942, Camp Commander Dinko Sakic and Camp Supervisor Marx Luberic. Here is the complex of Yasenovac and the map of Yasenovac. This is one of the few uh, photos which survived the entrance of Stara Gradishka. Again, Stara Gradishka, a watchtower in the same camp. A brick factory at Yasenovac concentration camp. Uh, Roma arrested uh, in Yasenovac. Again, Roma. Prisoner arriving in Yasenovac. Slave labor work. Uh, slave labor work. Children in Stara Gradishka. Kozara camp. Sign to mark Jewish prisoners. Insignia for Serbs. Sorry for showing you such horrible photos. Um, men and women tortured to death in Yesenovac by the Ustasha criminals. This is the famous Serb cutter, Srobjes, uh, used in Yesenovac <coughs> again. And other uh, methods of killing, of brutal, sadistic killing. This is a very famous photo showing a Jewish man 
which have, has just arrived to Yesenovac and has to give up his uh, wedding ring. It's not so easy for him after so many years. I you know that his finger was just cut to enable the Ustasha men to get the ring. A brutal murder by Ustasha forces uh, in 1942 or 43. Uh, they are holding their victim and they will soon cut his head. Here we see a horrible photo execution with a saw in Yasenovats. I'm sorry, I have to show you such brutalities. Confiscation of properties. They like to stand in the middle of their corpses. They liked it. Bodies of murdered prisoners, again. Horrible. Bodies in the Sava River in 1945. Many such bodies were in the water for many, many months after the end of the war in the Sava River. Children at Stara Gradishka. Photos of murdered Serbs and Jews murdered in the train of camps of Yesenovats. All were happy people with dreams and programs, all murdered in Yesenovats, Jews and others. This is the presentation. And uh, I would like to emphasize also the fact that the Germans had a genocide program to eliminate all Jews living in this world, but also Ustasha had a genocide against the Serb people, not to let Serbs remain alive at all. Thanks God they didn't succeed, um, and, but the plans were there to eliminate all Serbs wherever they can be found and caught and imprisoned. Thank you so much. Thank you for your both patience and that you try to show uh, the pictures one more time. So Horrible pictures. Horrible pictures, but thank you anyway. Very informative. And well, I guess now we have come to the very end uh, of this year's conference. Uh, thank you all for participating and thank you all for watching. We hope we have aroused uh, your interest for this topic and that there will be much more research on Yasenovac concentration camp. This knowledge is, as said previously during the conference, very much needed if you want to pave the way for new generations who through a culture of remembrance may learn tackle the sorrows of the past and in an honorable and peaceful manner. The last but not the least, for everyone who wants to explore the topic in artistic way, we recommend watching the movie Dara of Yasinovats with its official opening in the United States tonight. And the movie Diary of Diana B. Let us know if you find the most in eat the same mistakes when we have learned about and from them. Have a nice evening. <laughs>